Disco Elysium, a video game from developer Zalm, one that has won numerous awards and praise. A game that really pushes the boundary on what narratives and characters are possible in a video game. But calling this a video game, while being technically true, might be misleading to some. It's more of an interactive book, a story, that you can tangibly take hold of. Yet, despite this, there is likely an immediate question from some of you. Why is a philosophy and theory channel interested in this, in a mere video game? The answer is, for all the philosophy and philosophical themes present in fiction and literature, works like Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Camus' The Plague, and Kafka's Metamorphosis, I'm willing to argue this game does a better job at presciently conveying a multitude of themes than almost any other work of fiction and artistically applied philosophy. And to me, that is a huge deal. Before we get going, I want to add that I will keep this as spoiler-free as possible. I cannot promise there will not be a few hints at the story's development here and there, but I can promise the main story, larger parts, and its conclusions will absolutely be protected. You are in good hands here if you choose to play this game after watching this video, which you absolutely should. Of course, this video is for everyone. If you have played Disco Elysium, it may add perspective to your experience. If you haven't, it will explore some philosophical themes found in other forms of literature and art. If anything, I hope this video serves as a push for people to explore new avenues of art and things like video games. As film has become a new established medium of philosophical analysis, I too hope we can apply the same foundational rigor to video games. And hopefully, with this video, I can do just that. So, with all of this out of the way, let's dive right into it. This is the philosophy of Disco Elysium, just in video form. This story starts out in a hyper-real, turbulent world of Elysium, and more specifically in a salt-of-the-earth city called Revishal, with the game taking place within the district of Martinez, a blue-collar, lower-middle-class area where the local shipping union controls most of its functions, with you playing as a drug-addicted, larger-than-life detective set to solve a murder case of a hangman behind a bar, all with your partner Kim Katsuragi, of course. The story immerses you in the world of Elysium, the weird, hyper-real intricacies that mirror our own world and with an absolutely insane journey from start to finish. I knew from the end of the first day on the case in Disco Elysium, during the scene on the balcony sharing a cigarette with your partner Kim, this is one of the most special games I have played. The dying lights of the city shimmer below. Slowly, like luminous clouds, they pass on his lenses. The lieutenant looks at his slim cigarette, contemplating the next drag. They really don't like us here. And the mouth on that kid, you know. It's different in them, in Jamrock, in the GRIH. It's our fault for leaving this place to the dogs, to the union, to the company, not daring to come here more often. This place has fallen between the cracks, the jurisdictions of our two prisons. We run this city. West of the river is our CM land. It's incredibly hard. Human beings are. But we are in control, and it's worth it. The organization works. Our systems work. If they didn't, the city would disintegrate. Me too. But I wouldn't count on any drastic changes in our lifetimes. At the beginning, the game places you in a confusing dream sequence, a dream from the character you play named Harry Dubois, who is in the midst of an episode, or rather, THE episode, of alcohol-induced amnesia, an amnesia that wipes his memory of most things in the world, other than his immediate motor functions and intuitive sensibilities. There is nothing, only warm primordial blackness. Your conscious for men sinny, no larger than a single grain of malt. You don't have to do anything anymore. He wakes up to remember nothing, not even his face, only to see a hotel room completely trashed, 
clothes all over, a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine destroyed, and worse of all, a broken window. Now, there is a lot here regarding philosophy, right from the get-go. The one philosophical connection game journalists, journalists in general, have made is that this game represents a clear influence towards existentialism, a philosophical approach that emphasizes one's experience in the world as a free individual and the raw, often crippling interaction we have with choice and the freedom to choose alone. This isn't necessarily wrong, it's rather correct in some respects, and there are existential themes that hearken to existentialist thinkers like Sartre and Kierkegaard. But despite the immediate reception, the most striking theme that is represented in the beginning of the game doesn't seem to be existentialism. And I'll explain this here. Nearly all RPGs, by default, on the surface, seem to immediately represent existentialist themes and philosophy. For many who don't play games, an RPG is short for a role-playing game, a game where you construct your character and make choices throughout the game. RPGs truly seem like a representation of existentialism on the surface as you are thrusted into a world, in a game that is constructed, ground up, presented with choices throughout the game's story. But in my mind, like the world we live in, the veil of free choice tends to go out the window with further thought. In games, when you think about it a step further, you actually control the character, with the interactions and story changing the potential choices your character is also given. This, in many ways, mirrors our own reality. In my mind, free will is something that is not a given fact. Whether that be philosophical excursions into things like psychoanalysis, or newer research in hard sciences such as neuroscience, which are now, with newer research, showing that in general cognition, many synapses in our brain fire before we cognitively come to a decision. Thus, these psychochemical and motor functions may predetermine our thought to begin with, our actions. The philosopher may have been first to devise a theory against free will, but neuroscientists are starting to hammer this in in new ways. That free will very well may be illusory. The immediate philosophical marking of Disco Elysium doesn't seem to be existentialism in my mind, but one of psychoanalysis. Matter of fact, psychoanalysis is arguably the biggest marking of this game. But for most of us playing this game or watching this video, we come from a society molded from Western liberalism. In action, we are Western liberals in a material sense, whether we like it or not, whether our core abstract sensibilities deem otherwise. That is why, in my mind, it is so easy to draw parallels to existentialism in art, or simply find it in life. It mirrors our own sociological ideology. Existentialism represents the perfect metaphysical theory of life posited from the Enlightenment and Enlightenment liberalism. The self-governed subject in an alien world who goes about life with the crippling responsibility of choice. And again, this is correct in many ways, but what this game really excels at in my mind, whether on purpose or not, is the present tones of the subconscious and a Freudian and Lacanian experience of the self. The game would have you believe you start out in a tabula rasa, a blank state, free to mold Harry Dubois as he awakes with a wiped memory and amnesia. But that is not totally so. All his impulses are still there. You, behind the scenes, are still there. He is only a free subject insofar as he is tethered to these things, to the other. What is this other than the Lacanian subject? A theory of how we relate to the world, ourselves, other people, in relation to signifiers and existing social and lingual structures. Structures that actually drive you, not you driving yourself. Harry is haunted by past demons he does not quite understand. And in his newfound alcohol-induced amnesia, he really doesn't understand. Yet, he knows these ghosts are there. These are presented by the voices throughout the game that represent portions of his psyche. Mechanically, in the game, you level up personality traits that will also change the trajectory and overall narrative of the game. We can make Harry a more empathetic person. We can make him smarter by leveling up logic, etc. With these ordained traits, with his past, we are faced with trauma right in the beginning of the game, where Harry does not remember his face. Yet, despite warnings from his psyche, particularly 
the psyche the game calls Inland Empire, not to look in the mirror. Yet, if you choose, you can wipe away the fog and witness the expression, as the game calls it. As you slowly reach your hand towards the surface of the mirror. Abort. You clearly have not thought this through. You won't like what you see there, and you will never unbecome it. Behold. You have no idea who this thing is, do you? He meets his face for the first time, but is rightfully horrified with what he sees. Blatant facial evidence of alcoholism and rampant drug abuse aside, this isn't what is truly horrifying. Like when you are on a psychedelic trip, the physical woes or makeup of your face is not what is totally haunting. It's the representation or meaning of it. Harry stands there with a grin stuck on his face, permanently. It's this very happy grin, his face, that reminds him of the all-consuming lack. And this lack isn't something innate to Harry. This emptiness is foundational to everything in psychoanalysis and everything within Harry, a lack he seeks to cover up with this grin. If there is a universal present in psychoanalysis, it is that everything is centered on a lack, on a void. This thematically harkens us back to thinkers like Lacan immensely. Desire, a function central to all human experience, is the desire for nothing nameable. And at the same time, this desire lies at the origin of every variety of animation. If being were only what it is, there wouldn't even be room to talk about it. Being comes into existence as an exact function of this lack. The positive element of his life, the grin Harry shows to the world, is just to mask this very lack. Now, going back to ourselves and the real world, the things we do, how we love, interact, is to mask this very lack. This is why Lacan says when you love someone, you mutilate them. Love is a violent act. This sounds confusing at first, but this love is a love that stems from something that does not actually exist in true reality. The vision you create for someone isn't necessarily ontologically pure or true. The things you love about someone or something isn't true reality. It's a fantasy that you project onto something. You are adding something, a positive value, say love, say hate, to something to make sense of the true ontological nothingness around you. Like. My first time hearing this, this is something that will confuse you immensely, and there's really nothing more I can add to this that can make it easier to understand. So, let's take five seconds to decompress and think on all the weird things I just said. Alright, now that you still probably don't completely understand, that's okay. You really don't need to, especially concerning psychoanalysis. This not understanding is ironically the point, I promise. With this, the game starts with Harry almost yearning for death, for this nothing Lacan speaks of, the comfort of this nothingness itself. It's living, being present in the world, and in the case of Disco Elysium, looking at your disembodied face in the mirror that reminds you of this central lack. And this lack can be seen as a desirable entity in many ways. La mort. Et du domaine de la foi. Vous avez bien raison de croire que vous allez mourir, bien sûr. Ça vous soutient. Si vous n'y croyez pas, est-ce que vous pourriez supporter la vie que vous avez? Yet, the one thing most people think to is suicide. Suicide really is far too apparent, upfront and conscious if you will. We really see nothingness and human impetuses seen in things like the Freudian death drive, ideological gatekeeping, etc. But these are things immediately unknown to our immediate consciousness. If anything, what I hope to establish is that Disco Elysium operates not at the level of existential free will per se, but at a fundamental level of psychoanalytic determinism something that does away with free will. In the game, you control Harry. Harry does not control himself, his actions, 
his new extreme political beliefs. His newly wiped amnesiac state is still controlled by you and the already existing instinctual intuitive voices that represents the forgotten sentiments of his past. In the game, Harry's different personality traits talk and narrate throughout. Harry is still there, as the little voices that narrate the game show us, but of course, he doesn't completely know this. This too, under the context of psychoanalysis, is our experience as subjects in the world. We do things for reasons we do not fully understand. We desire things not known to us. To wrap up the psychoanalysis of Harry, especially in Lacanian context, Harry is always contending with the big other. The player, us setting the barriers of proper unspoken rules, the very symbols that mask the empty chasm of the real. The chasm that keeps coming up as Dolores Day. The masking of the expression. His constant grin is the very signal of this. To hide. To symbolize beyond the empty real. Amidst his angst and sadness, his lack. He wishes to remain seen as disco light, the life of the party, and the weird flamboyant man that he is, but also is not. There is a constant dialectic in this game. Harry's happy grin to mask this negative lack, and Harry's unorthodox interactions and quirky conversation style. Something that seems to negate this big other. A set of social rules and acceptable parameters. As he seems to do whatever he wants, despite it potentially being socially awkward. Yet, this social code he abides by is just that, another social code, another big other that directs him. And this symbolization, code, lack, sets up Harry's imaginary that can be seen with his rather extreme flamboyant views on political ideology. The Lacanian real, imaginary, and symbolic are all present here. The symbolic scene in his use of language the structured parameters in which he approaches the world, the imaginary in his wild sense of political ideology, and the real of the expression. Here I am applying Lacan's psychoanalysis and philosophy to Disco Elysium, but I'm not necessarily explaining Lacan. So, for many, things like the symbolic, the real, etc. are all very confusing language. If you are new to Lacan and Lacanian psychoanalysis and need more insight on the terminology I just used, I will link Plastic Pills here. He explains Lacan very well. The world of Elysium, the city of Revishal, within the district of Martinez, and the people who inhabit it are just as paramount, if not more, than the main protagonist, Harry. The world of Elysium is an exaggerated mirror image of our own. It quite literally represents the honest underbelly of our history and our world today. Because of the almost seemingly perfect writing and set, one of the bizarre things I thought may turn into a criticism was the constant dialogue around political ideology. At any point, a conversation with a stranger could turn into a political conversation. Due to the structural realism in this game, I thought this was quite weird at first, and an immediate flaw. I thought to myself, People don't talk about politics this freely in our own world. Then it immediately dawned on me. That's the very point. Elysium stands to be the honest incarnation of our world. If anything, Elysium stands to be more of an honest depiction of our sympathies and entanglement around political ideology. The very exaggeration of Elysium showcases our raw, hidden reality. And it does it well. A reality that may be repressed in our own, but something worn on its sleeve in Elysium. The world, the city, is rough, reflecting more honestly the struggles of working people today in our own world. In Elysium, nearly everyone is lower to middle class. Families live in one-bedroom apartments, public infrastructure is hardly kept up. Families, people, are one financial disaster away from total poverty. Besides the local shipping union in Martinez, immediate worker protection against raw market fundamentalism is not very common. But very insecure gig work and collecting trash to make ends meet is. Alcoholism and drug use is through the roof. Many of the game's historical events mirror our own. Yet, in other fantasy realism fictional worlds, much of society seems to be blatantly dystopian. Cyberpunk is such example. 
and Disco Elysium, not so much. Our very world is illustrated by Rebishal as a world that's flawed, but surprisingly works, and with a system that scrapes by. Revishal is marked by a long civil war, as Revishal used to have a king who was cocaine addicted and quite a bad ruler, when the communards, in Disco Elysium this is the name for communist, fought back and overthrew the king to establish a commune, all when the coalition, an international body of capitalist governments, overthrew the commune of Revishal establishing Revishal as a zone of control, where you are governed internationally via the coalition. Oddly enough, you being a detective of the RCM, Revishal Citizens Militia, you are one of the few pieces of an old communal institution the coalition allowed to exist. All amidst a governing body from the coalition that mirrors the economics of Reagan and Thatcher neoliberalism, but some of the more social acceptance of contemporary center politics. Although it's a common gaming cliche to save face, it's incredibly silly to think political dialogue isn't involved in nearly every open world RPG game. Skyrim, The Witcher 3, New Vegas, you name it, it is there. But what happens is the ideological commentary becomes a small, laughably vague subtext as it's often avoided to alienate audiences. With only a few exceptions to this rule. Disco Elysium puts this to the forefront, in genius ways, but elaborates on the state of ideology as something through a lens of absurdism. It makes fun of its attempt to integrate politics into the game, all while showcasing an absurd chaos to how ideology and events function in this game. Just like Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus and the eternal enslavement of rolling a boulder up a hill his entire life, we feel this burden throughout the people of Elysium, and the stark longing for meaning, meaning that may be coaxed by adopting said political ideology. Uh, it's about biological determinism, natural law, the sorting of the races. Not the most popular topic nowadays, with a coalition in charge and all. You might want to change the topic. That is, bury your head under the sand like, come on, sheep. Change the topic. The way he says it makes it almost sound like a threat. I'm not just racist. Look, I've read books. Huh? The science of racial theory has all been proved, even if uh, some people don't want to accept it. But it isn't just meaning here. If anything, absurdity lies in something not necessarily internal, where we internally long for meaning in existential context, I find absurdity to be a rather external force in Elysium, something metaphysical. It's the chaos of understanding this world is extremely flawed, with very real material inadequacies seen in many places. Yet, the system manages to stay alive. It manages to function. People wake up in the morning to go to their jobs. They still value the ability to see their families and friends. We see this with the bartender and the whirling in rags. He understands the place is deeply flawed and in need of some repairs, but amidst his annoyance with his work, he quietly admits the whirling in rags, the hotel and bar he manages, is growing on him. Amidst the chaos and degradation, there is character with the whirling in rags, and Martinez that Gart, the bartender, has grown to love. Despite his annoyance with it, the Hardy Boys, which I am intentionally keeping quiet about as there is a huge amount of development with them, echo the very same sentiments. They understand the inadequacies, the poverty in Martinez, yet, being an organized group within the Union, they love and look out for the people of Martinez regardless. <laughs> What's that, copper? You want us to help little old ladies now? You're local law enforcement, aren't you? Helping troubled civilians should fall under your jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. We'll send someone out. Who is? Wait. It's the pigs, isn't it? God. Poor lady. Don't worry. We'll handle this. I think she got some family in Kurong or something. Bastards left her alone when she got sick. We've been getting complaints. No problem, old cop man. 
We take care of our mentally ill here in Martinez. Ain't that right, boys? Classier, a foreign, overeducated character from the Isola of Oranje, a much more prosperous area than Revishala Martinez, among very clear material degradation, she loves Revishal nonetheless. It's the authentic salt of the earth that she feels connected to. In our own world, have any of you ever been to an extremely wealthy suburb in America? It feels dead, empty, hollow, a void of absolute nothingness. Nothing actually fundamentally lives in places like this. It's within this very absurd authenticity many of the characters in Elysium remain in the district of Martinez. We see themes of the absurd in art and in media, especially ones supposed to invoke comedy, and Disco Elysium does this a lot. One of the craziest things about this game is that it's actually a comedy, yet its depth is something so immense videos analyzing Disco Elysium rarely cut into the immediate humor. It's the very deep cultural subtext present that really brings it to life. So when I first played this game, I didn't expect the crazy humor everywhere. Critique is a bright spot in this game. But again, one of the more inaccurate readings that I find of this game is that Disco Elysium is one of just continual critique, one of postmodern distant irony, something we see in later 20th century media and that has been critiqued from individuals like David Foster Wallace. From the consistent critical dialogue of nearly all political ideology, this seems like an immediate conclusion to come to. This game is a walking critique. But this too seems shallow. If anything, it's also a critique of critique, in more ways than one. In many ways, there is a deep dialectical tone present at all points in this game. The Marxian dialectical tone of the Union versus the Wild Pine shipping company a Hegelian master-slave dialectic between Harry and Kim, where Harry begins to recognize himself amongst the intelligent otherness of Kim, and, of course, the game's dialectical critique of critique itself. I find that dialectics, especially when concerning cultural theory, can lend itself to a very dark irony, an almost overwhelming sense of constant critique and cynicism. If anything, some of the original origins of critical theory can feel like this seen in texts like Adorno and Horkheimer's Dialectic of Enlightenment, where they showcase a newer cold ideology of domination, a cold mechanical harshness seen in the 20th century from Enlightenment that is supposed to combat myth, yet folds itself into myth in the processual guise of fascism. Despite the grimmer tones that can arise from critical theory, I don't completely find this present in Disco Elysium. This game may be a larger critique, a negation of certain ideological functions, but through the chaotic, absurd nothingness of the world, the game almost begs us to look at what still is, and the constant is in this game is relationship. There's a massive subtext in this game that can be easy to miss. It's that no matter the absurd destitution, the struggled march of history, there is relationship. This is seen everywhere, but one of the largest beacons being Kim Katsuragi, your partner throughout the crime investigation. Harry is chaotic, unorthodox, and drives people up a wall, especially among his drunken, drug-fueled shenanigans. Yet, Kim understands and is there. If anything, there is a pragmatic understanding of what is happening, certain situations that are unfolding, and Kim doesn't put himself, his ego, in the way. With Kim, there is a radical acceptance and hidden love within everything. With Harry, the citizens he genuinely wants to serve, and Revishal at large, even amidst a fascist lorry driver. Kim seems to embody a perfect humanness that we desire in others, in the most authentic way too. There's another huge reason why Kim is among my most favorite characters in literature or media ever. It's the narrative backdrop against him that really pulls this out too. Politics and political ideology is, of course, a centerpiece of this game. And in an abstract way, Kim has, in many different ways, what many would view to be as problematic politics. He is, in the world of Elysium, a moralist. Which is to say, in our own world, the dreaded centrist liberal everyone hates. Yet, he really dislikes fascists and feels more understanding towards the old, now almost extinct communist. 
there are other aspects of Kim I would like to not divulge and allow you to discover yourself. But what the game's narrative points to is the sheer ineffectiveness of political identity. If anything, the game likes to point out the egotistical fetish we have towards political identification today. The notion that someone is only as good as their quote-unquote politics. I would like to say the game's critique is the notion of having politics. As in the game, everyone actually has specific politics, yet they continually contradict them when interacting with others. Gary, the crypto-fascist, is more than willing to help you with the zoologist expedition. Joyce, a corporate executive from the Wild Pines, who was sent to Revishal due to the union strike, isn't an evil, moralized character, and the Hardy Boys go well beyond initial appearances. This game isn't of constant postmodern critique. If anything, I would call it something of an absurd modernism. The world and happenings, like our own, are chaotic, don't seem to follow any set comprehensive logic. Yet, despite the chaos, it's relationship that gets to the root, not the facade of political identification. The point is, we don't have politics. Politics is elsewhere. What we do have is people. With Kim and groups like the Hardy Boys as huge examples of this. This is the important reading I find with Disco Elysium. It isn't just a ruthless critique of our own world, about the incessant chasm of the real we see within Harry. It's Kim's understanding of responsibility, the Hardy Boys, and the Union's understanding of what the people of Martinez face with an economy bent on raw market fundamentalism. Disco Elysium stands to show the positive element that relationship plays. This story isn't one of raw postmodern critique, it's absurd modernism. That within the absurd chaos around us, the one constant foundation that lays bare is love, relationship, and connection. And for this, and its brilliant writing, strong characters, amazing atmosphere, and world, this is why I believe Disco Elysium is one of the greatest, most powerful games I have ever played. Thank you all for watching and making it to the end. Of course, with a channel of this size and in an essay type format, this channel is quite literally funded by you all. This is how I make ends meet and how I continue to make these videos. If you enjoy this content, consider pledging a few dollars a month on Patreon or the YouTube member section as to ensure I can keep doing this. I have lots of perks like early access, exclusive content, voting on videos, Discord access, editing tutorials, and the like but most of all, that I can pay the bills and survive and continue to create this style of content. To end this off, other than the wonderful people that help keep this going, I want to give an extra large thanks to these wonderful patrons for going above and beyond to ensure the survivability of this channel. Jose David Guevara, J.R. Og, Stacy Solano, and Kate. Thank you guys for lifting this channel up. I truly could not do it without you. That wraps it up for this video. I hope to see all of you later.